on our altar before making the offerings. This is all interconnected. I'm going to hit all of this in one shot for all of you. Before doing that, we have six preparatory practices. Six. All right? For any altar, six preparatory practices, which is very important. Before you set up an altar and make offerings and get your tanka and bring your statue here. All right? Hmm. Those are six preliminary or six preparatory. One, cleaning the place of practice and setting up the altar. Cleaning the place. So to clean it very well, to clean it with concentration and with awareness. Why? It is a very powerful. You're not, you see, cleaning itself is not intrinsically good or bad. But cleaning so that you can impress your lover, impress somebody that you're good and you're wonderful, is negative karma. But cleaning with the intent to bring a holy being in so that you can represent a clear state of mind with this cleanliness, that this is what you wish to achieve, and you offer that cleanliness to the three jewels. So when you clean, it creates that type of uh, inclination. So when you clean with the motivation, it's very powerful. So people who make offerings, they should be very focused on cleaning. Cleaning the glass, cleaning the, whatever, the, the tables, cleaning around, being very neat and pre precise and almost to, very meticulous. And the floor, clean from top to bottom, not bottom to top. I see some people make offerings and they sweep. No. Wrong. Why? When you sweep, all the dust goes in. Dust go in or not doesn't disturb the Buddha, but it shows your lack of awareness, your lack of concentration, total lack. So some of you house husbands out there who, who haven't spent one day in the kitchen, you're going to spend one day in Buddha's kitchen, make sure the offerings are fabulous. So the first, and then the altar itself, basic minimum, should be a representation of the Buddha's body in the center. Okay? A basic representation of the Buddha's body. Any Buddha, whatever you like, your meditational deity, what not. Then on this side, I don't want to say left and right, because I'm going to get, I, I've been asked this many times, your left, his right, her right, who's right, who's left? I'll make it very simple for you people who don't know left and right. Buddha here, Buddha here, right? The Dharma scripture here, and a stupa here. Just like over here. Okay, you write your left, your right, my right, your right. I don't know, like you write whatever right, right you think is right. So a basic altar, after cleaning up, you set up the altar. The Buddha image, whatever Buddha, you know, Shakyamuni, Lama Tsongkhapa, whatever, you know, you have your yidams and practices. If you have a few deities, there's a way of placing them. And that's out of awareness also. So you put the Buddha here, you put the Dharma scripture here, and you put the stupa here. The Buddha body, the Buddha image represents the holy body of the Buddha. You wish to purify your negativity, the Buddha you, uh, body you've collected for many lifetimes. And you wish to attain the Buddha body in all the magical, mystical abilities that come along with that. And then, on top of that, you have the Buddha scripture representing all. You don't have to have every single scripture. You have one to represent or two up to you. That's why in our, in our outlets, I um, have beautiful scriptural containers and holders with glass made of wood painted with beautiful scriptures inside. And you can have the Tibetan scriptures. I, I prefer Tibetan scriptures over um, the books. Why? It just looks more holy. <laughs> looks more scriptural. But it's up to you. So I imported a lot of beautiful scriptures that are printed and made in Gandhin Monastery by the monks themselves. And that the little bit of few rupees that they earn goes to their sustenance. So it helps the monastery. And I have beautiful Tara texts, Vajugini texts, Yamataka texts. Wow, you can't read it, but who cares? It's holy. And if you put those texts in a container, whatever, nearby, it represents all the Buddha's speech. And that all the things that you said and done with your speech that you regret, may be purified, and may you gain the 60 qualities of Buddha's holy speech, 60 qualities. And that when you speak, may it be of like nectar and medicine to others and benefit. Whatever comes out of your mouth, indirectly, directly, may it benefit and benefit and benefit. Because it is by speech the Dharma is conveyed. And then on this side, okay, I don't know what you guys want to call this, this side is a stupa. Stupa has eight forms. A stupa is a physical representation of the enlightened characters or characteristics of a Buddha mind. So each part of the stupa, how it's placed, how it's stacked, and the levels and the numbers all represent a particular characteristic of a Buddha's mind. A Buddha's mind is non-tangible form, without form and colorless. So to represent that, we have a stupa, a, re a reliquary. And traditionally, the stupas are all over. In China, they call it a pagoda. All over the Buddhist world is not just Tibet. And there's eight main forms of stupas that can be made. 
eight main forms. In our retreat center in the future, we must make stupas outside, big ones. We have families sponsor one or two families combined or, or you know, couples or whatever. It's very powerful. Why? Depending on the stupas inside, you can put wealth phases. You can put the con contents of your holy lama's ashes and body or even um, hair, the clothes of high uh, lamas or relics. You can put many, many tatas. And if you're very fortunate and lucky, you can make thousands, thousands of tatas and seal it well and put it inside the stupas. Why? When people circumambulate, they're circumambulating around that many Buddhas. And you can put many Dharma texts inside, many, many wealth phases. So you can fill it with wealth phases. People go down there once, they go there, hit 4D. They come back, they say, I like you. Why not? And they can be Zambala stupas. They can be Tsongkhapa stupas, victory stupas, Namgyalma stupas, Tsongkhapa stupas. Wow. And to decorate it beautifully with bells on top. So that each time it rings, it resounds the sound of Dharma. The stupas themselves represent a complete iconography of the characteristics of a Buddha's mind. So when you have a stupa, any size, see this one I got, I like very much because I like the old style one, the Indian style. And I had it gold plated and I had it on um, um, lacquer. And then inside contains my personal guru's relics. I have His Holiness the Dalai Lama's clothes in here. Pabongo Rimji's clothes, Trijan Rimji's clothes. I have the hair and the nails of my Guru Kebji Kensu Rimji. I have the hair and the beard of His Holiness Kebji Song Rimji. And I have several very holy mantras, such as the Vajugini mantra, written in Song Rimji's own hand. And Song Rimji's personal mantra, Oma Guru Beza Sumti Vira Munishasana Donza Siddhi Hong Hong, he wrote himself at my request. He's so humble when I asked him for his personal name mantra. He wrote it, and I was jumping up and down. I went and showed my, uh, my other teacher. He said, no, that's his gurus. I said, who's that? He said, Trijana I said, I don't want Trijana I want his. Uh, stupid what? Anyway, I, I, um, I went back. I said, I want your, 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 your. So he wrote his own mantra, and I'm so humble, and I kept that in here. And then several chakras that Rimichi made with his own holy hands. He made three chakras. It took him weeks. I saw him working on it. I don't know why. Then he came out, and he went like this to me. He said, which one do you want? Of course, I grabbed a big, colorful one. And um, it turned out to be a high grief of chakra. Incredible. He was doing that for me because he knows I would be traveling, a lot of obstacles and difficulties along the road. And I have many, many holy items in here. Many. Many. And the holy Dharma Palas, the holy Dharma protectors in Ganden who take um, trance of the oracle, the Kudin. And when Dharma protectors come, they bless, they also give. It's also in here. Everything. So this is very precious to me. And it also has some initiations I've received that is a connection to me, my Lama, and my, my um, Idam. My, my deities. It's a physical representation of the connection, uh, the commitment that we have is also here, given to me by Sangha Ramachi. So there's a lot of precious items in here that are of no physical, uh, you know, monetary value to anybody, but on a spiritual it's powerful. That's why these things don't contain things I feel is holy. They are holy on itself. It's intrinsically holy, that's it. So that's why I carry this around as object worship and I put on people's head. Why? When it's put on your head, it temporarily removes the obscurations to listen. To see it, to hear, temporarily removes obscurations to listen to the Dharma to go in. Very, very holy, very powerful. So on our altar, we should have a stupa representing the Buddha's mind, who is one with our guru, the Buddha, and the Dharma scripture. So every time you make offerings, every time you make prostrations, any time you light an incense, you're not lighting incense only Buddha's body, a statue, his speech and mind. I mean, when you become a Buddha, you want to have speech and his mind. You don't want to just be a lifeless corpse Buddha body, right? A zombie Buddha. Stupas is basic on your altar. You can have more than a few deities. You can have the main, you can have your one deity here, you have your scripture here, you have your stupa here. And it's clean, it's prepared, and it's, it's beautiful. It's for you. It's for you to collect merits. It's for you to make prostrations and offerings. It's for you to generate incredible merit for you to gain realizations and to free yourself of obscurations. And those images should be the best that you can make. The best. And there's no time or place where you put it. Any time you can put it, any place you can put it, except the toilet, of course. Any, any place, any time. You know, it's unlike the Taoist tradition here where they respect a lot the worldly gods. They're scared, actually, that you move it at this time. Only this person can move it, that person can move it. Well, I can say that, too. You know, your statue is only Rinpoche can put it in, only Rinpoche can remove it, and every time I come in and out, you know what? Get that red envelope out. No. Buddhas can never be offended. You can never do anything wrong with them. But the more careful you are, the more respect you show is creation of awareness in your mind. You can't hurt the Buddhas. You can't do anything to them. Nothing. If they can be hurt, they're not Buddhas. So that's basically it for, um, uh, without getting into lengthy details about that. Cleaning the place and practicing setting up the altar. Wiping, dusting, sweeping, and removing the dust. 
even removed us as a, a meditation. And once you set up the altar, as I described just now, arranging an attractive display of offerings, whatever you want to offer, whether you have silver cups, wooden cups, you have two sets, three sets, it doesn't really matter. The more sets, the better. Why? How fast do you want to achieve your spiritual um, results? And especially if you have big projects, if you have big goals, if you have big um, aims, the more offerings you make, directly they will affect your aims to come true faster. Directly. So on a worldly level, samsaric level, making offerings is a direct cause for creating wealth and purifying poverty. So we're afraid of being poor. If we're afraid in future life we're going to be poor, this life we're going to lose what we have, or we want to get something we don't have. Making offerings is a direct counter to poverty and a direct, not indirect, method for gaining wealth. And there are many great lamas, if you read their biographies, many, that when they first entered the monastery, they, when they, whatever, those who are very dedicated to making offerings, very dedicated. In the beginning, they have a few plastic cups, well, not in Tibet, in India, yes, a few stainless steel, a few little, not very nice ones. And then as the years go by, you start seeing silver cups, you see everything around the lama grow and increase. The lama's ladrang, the lama's abilities, the lama's teaching, the lama's mind, the lama's wealth, everything about the lama will increase. Why? By the power of making offerings. And if you have a Dharma institution and you want the Dharma to be a very great benefit to others, you should make many, many offerings in your Dharma institution with the best of the offerings that you can afford. The best is according to your means. The best can be wood. It doesn't really matter. And if you make more and you make vast offerings and daily, awareness will grow. Merits will increase. And merits for enlightenment, yes. And attainments, yes. But for removing the obstacles to your personal endeavors of getting wealth. That is for sure. That says here directly. Directly. That is no joke. No joke. 